Hi everyone, we're here for a new webinar of the IL Jamone module um, together with us, Mary Catherine uh, Petersman, senior researchers at Tilburg Law School of Tilburg University and uh, currently a resident fellow at the Instituto Svizzero in Rome. Um, Mary Catherine today will uh, talk to us about um, or or let's say she will start talking to us about the topic of her recent book, uh, which has been published by Cambridge University Press, uh, When Environmental Protection and Human Rights Collide, The Politics of Conflict Management by Regional Courts. Uh, but she will touch upon also a lot of other interesting topics that relate to uh, basically the, um, the evolution of her research after the publication of, of, of that book. Uh, I will give the floor to Ricardo for some uh, additional quick words of introduction before we move to uh, Maria and her presentation. Yes, I will uh, just uh, uh, speak very, very briefly, just to say a couple of more words about uh, uh, Marie Catherine Petersman. Uh, we are very happy to have her, her here. I must confess that I followed her since uh, the beginning of her PhD career at the, at the European University Institute uh, was some 10 years ago. And I remember very well when she published an article about these topics in the Italian yearbook of international law, which was volume 24. And I was so uh, amazed that after that, uh, uh, her career went on uh, uh, very, very well with other prestigious publications in other journals, always relating to this topic, the interface between environmental protection and human rights. So I was very, very happy to, to see her PhD uh, uh, thesis being transformed into this uh, uh, book uh, published uh, within one of the most uh, seriously one of the most important uh, series uh, in international law, which is the Cambridge Studies in International and European uh, 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 Cambridge Studies in European and Comparative Law. Uh, I don't want to say more about uh, by way of introduction to Marie. She holds a PhD and an LLM from uh, in international European law from the European University Institute and also an MA from, in international law from the Graduate Institute. As Dario said, she's currently a senior researcher at Tilburg Law School. And I was also very happy to learn that in um, 2022, so last year, she earned, she was awarded a prestigious grant, a research grant by the uh, Dutch Research Council uh, on a project entitled Anthropocene Legalities Reconfiguring Relations with In More Than Human Worlds. So, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Marie, the, the floor is yours. Welcome to our series, and uh, we are looking forward uh, to your presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Ricardo, for this very kind uh, introduction. Can you confirm you can see the, the slide? Does everything work? Yes, Marie. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. So, Thank you uh, again, Dario as well, Ricardo, for, for inviting me for this, uh, this, uh, this uh, book launch, book discussion, um, to offer me also an opportunity to discuss uh, the main arguments of the book, uh, not only with you, but also with the, the broader community of the European and International Environmental Law Jean Monnet uh, module in, uh, in Siena. It's really a great uh, pleasure to be here and to have a chance to engage with you. And also, of course, thank you for all of those who are taking the time to join the conversation uh, online today and those uh, who might be listening to it um, afterwards. So um, let me start uh, with uh, an overview of the main arguments of the book to then uh, situate them into developments that are currently taking place, um, especially in climate litigation and uh, policy. And these developments, were not incorporated uh, in the book, which, as uh, Ricardo just mentioned, started uh, with a PhD dissertation that I that I uh, began almost uh, ten years ago now. That's uh, frightening to 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 hear. But these contemporary uh, developments are, I believe, really important to think about the book's main interventions today. So about the book, this is essentially a book about uh, the story and the evolution of human rights-based approaches to environmental protection. 
And what ties the different arguments together and what um, has also driven my curiosity, but I must say also my skepticism when studying the relationship between environmental protection and human rights, is what happens in terms of world-making effects when human rights narratives, imaginaries, uh, schemes of institutional protection started being mobilized to protect what is understood today as the so-called environment, and especially what falls outside of this uh, frame of uh, protection. And uh, while the protection of the environment and the protection of human rights emerged as different fields of law with uh, distinct normative and institutional architectures, they became over time always more intertwined to the point of considering the protection of the environment and human rights as indivisible today, as we often hear in the, the literature. Now, of course, uh, that environmental protection is absolutely fundamental and key to the protection of a whole range of uh, human rights is undeniable. But what happens when um, human rights discourses, imaginaries, and strategies are mobilized to further environmental protection? Which interests and, and whose interests can be accounted for and um, how. So these are really a bit the, the, the main interrogations that animated me when uh, conducting this research. And evidently, human rights uh, considerations far exceed environmental concerns. Only particular human rights, mostly the right to health, to, to, to life, to adequate living conditions, to property, tend to be mobilized against the backdrop of environmental concerns. And equally so, environmental considerations might see the protection of human rights. Think, uh, for example, about the conservation of areas uh, that are off limits to uh, humans or the protection of coral reefs or um, other oceans, ecosystems, etc. So, of course, only environmental damages that directly interfere with human rights are those that have received the lion's share of legal attention. And this I argue, is due to um, a progressive mainstreaming of rights-based approaches to environmental protection. And against this backdrop, the book uh, not only situates and contextualizes, but also problematizes how environmental protection and human rights became entangled over time from early domestic conservation laws that were uh, strongly embedded in colonial enterprises to regional or transborder and later international and, and transnational institutional settings. And in this context, the 1972 Stockholm Declaration on the Human Environment is almost always viewed as the starting point of this entanglement. But um, the story of, of the, the encounter between environmental protection and human rights starts much earlier with the publication of, for example, environmental uh, manifestos that quickly became popular bestsellers in Western states and that really informed and shaped alarmist, neo malthusian racialized discourses that really underpin um, the, 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 the framing of how to safeguard the environment uh, and particular human rights protection. But ever since the, the Stockholm Declaration, the protection of the environment in legal discourses has almost inevitably been framed as benefiting human rights. And this is what I call in the book the synergistic mantra, and which I uh, retrieve within and across international environmental and international human rights law instruments. So one of the main arguments of the book is to show how, or, or to historically situate how this synergistic mantra emerged and resulted from a normative and a legislative shift in terms of protecting so-called nature from humans to protecting nature for humans. And here I want to stress that, um, of course, it's reductive to, to qualify this shift in such binary terms. And, and uh, since over time, contestations and counter movements that aimed at unsettling this dominant frame always existed. But my analysis in the book is centered on the, the sides of power and of authority that came to shape international debates and development in which are located in Western societies. And as such, the law that 
unfolded therefrom, and which can broadly uh, be considered as modern law, produced and continuously reproduces a binary distinction between humans and so-called nature or non-humans. And this transpires in the, the very definition of humans as subjects of law and as rights holders against the environment of non-humans as objects of law or objects of legal relations between humans. And which, again, today, of course, we, we see being, uh, this discourse being pushed against, uh, true legislations and, um, uh, and, uh, and, um, and uh, litigations on rights of nature, for example. But so as I also uh, argue in the book, while, while my analysis uh, focuses on and problematizes how the relationship between environmental protection and human rights came to be framed in and by modern international environmental and human rights law, of course, many other ways of thinking, of practicing, of embodying a sense of care for the environment always existed beyond, beneath, and outside of these dominant schemes, from native uh, and indigenous cosmovisions that long predated and survived settlers' colonial taking over their land and its regulation, to a myriad of uh, other minoritarian and resisting worldviews that always refused the capitalist-oriented world ecology that Western states were and are still putting forward, including through their laws. So the book thereby also retrieves how um, political ecologists, critical um, anthropologists, and decolonial and 12 scholars long pointed out and deplored the conflicts of norms and of worldviews that underlie rights-based approaches to environmental protection. And the book, therefore, is firmly embedded in um, critical literatures that range from, from critical environmental law to critical legal theory and critical anthropocene studies, but puts them into dialogue with essential readings and practices that stem from outside of the confines of the legal discipline to really, I think, enrich our understandings of legal relations between humans and non-humans or, or, or broadly ecological concerns. And overall, against um, a generalized assertion of synergies that tends to take for granted that environmental protection and human rights are unnecessarily mutually beneficial, the book retraces and analyzes the tensions, trade-offs, and conflicts that also underpin this relationship. So now, of course, there are different uh, ways of um, reading or thinking about uh, what the book is, is doing, or rather what uh, I'm trying to do with uh, the book. First, I think the book um, looks at how conflicts tend to be overlooked in light of an overemphasis on synergies, and how legislators, adjudicators, scholars, all participate in uh, this neglect by overemphasizing the existence of synergies without paying due attention to conflict. And to show this, I stay with the troubles of these, uh, that these conflicts pose and try to meticulously describe their nature and their extent by showing how, for example, conservation measures um, like the creation of, of natural parks or preservation areas but also um, animal welfare measures can collide with indigenous or cultural minorities' rights, such as uh, Roma rights in, in Europe, for example, and I'll come back to that. Other conflicts that uh, I linger with relate to energy transition policies, such as climate adaptation and mitigation measures, and how they can collide with rights to family life and property rights, all trade-offs that uh, are becoming, of course, ever more timely and important to scrutinize today. And here, I, I want to stress that my objective was never to offer a comparative analysis of how regional human rights courts, from the European Court of Human Rights uh, to the CGU, the Inter-American Court and Commission on Human Rights, and the African Court and Commission on, on Human and People's Rights, on which the book uh, focuses, it was never how to, to, the focus was never on how to these mechanisms settle such uh, conflicts in the sense that I was not interested in determining whether and which of these institutions either got it right or wrong, but rather to explore how these courts respectively deal with uh, the trade-offs. So through what arguments, 
and justifications, and especially with what effects in terms of cross-collaborations between these courts on the one hand, and in terms of mobilization for the environmental and human rights agenda on the other hand. So this means that instead of focusing on the outcomes of each case, I attended to the reasoning and adversarial uh, argumentation in the courtroom. And so as such, it's really the, the justificatory framework that is constructed to legitimize the outcomes of the cases that interested me. Now, a close analysis of these conflicts led me to the, the crux of the research on how human rights courts manage and mediate such trade-offs and shed light on, on, on which strategies they develop to conceal the tensions and emphasize a convergence between environmental and human rights protection. And in this sense, then, the book um, tells also a story um, about the, the politics of adjudication of environmental issues by human rights courts and does so with a particular and a critical emphasis on the technique of balancing and proportionality. Now, how do regional human rights courts balance um, individual or collective human rights against the general interest in environmental protection? And in providing um, possible and always partial answers to this question, I focus on determining how regional rights, uh, human rights courts frame conflict with environmental law, which conflict management techniques and argumentative strategies courts develop to settle such conflicts, and what this tells us about how the environment is represented and its protection legally conceived and justified in relation to competing human rights concerns. So I won't uh, answer all um, of these questions here, but based on the case law analysis, I could distill two main um, two main uh, strategies. Sorry, I think this is the exactly the slide I want. So I could distill from this uh, this uh, careful case uh, this case law analysis two main strategies that courts deploy to settle conflicts between environmental and human rights protection by invoking first uh, the concept of the general interest and second, by having recourse to experts and expertise in order to grant legal weight and authority to particular arguments and concerns over others. And this fundamentally is done um, in an idiom of universality, when universal values, or rather values deemed universal, are invoked to grant weight to one claim over another in the balancing exercise. And this, of course, tells us much about the role and the world-making effects that courts play in shaping societies in the name of the common good. So concerning first the general interest, so the point, of course, was uh, not to, to contest that uh, protecting the environment is key to further uh, a general interest, but rather I was interested in unpacking what it means and whose interests are actually protected when courts invoke an abstract totalizing and universal general interest as benefiting society as a whole. And I therefore started by retrieving the meanings and the usages that the concept of the general interest bears in international law, then turned to its association to environmental concerns over time, and explored its relation to human rights protection in particular. And what comes out of this uh, this analysis is that distinctive argumentative dynamics are set in motion in the cases where both the protection of the environment and the protection of human rights are invoked and articulated in the name of the general interest, thereby turning the conflict into one of competing general interests. One can thereby see that when courts dictate that specific outcomes are in the general interest, they inevitably project particular ideals into the realm of universality. So just to give you an example, so one of the, the, the many cases that I uh, analyzed in the book was the, the Inuit case decided in 2015 by the Court of Justice of the European Union. And while animal welfare protection is not part of the competences of the EU, I looked at how the EU legislator ingeniously relied, among others, on the general interest in animal welfare protection 
in order to justify a ban of steel-related products on the EU market. And I look more specifically at how the exemption that was inserted in the steel regulation with regard to products derived from the traditional hunting by indigenous peoples collided with this putative general interest in animal welfare protection and how the court settled this heavily politicized conflict by relying on this general interest in which it also subsumed the particular interest of uh, the Inuit applicants. And to give you maybe just another example, another series of cases that I analyzed at length were a contestation over what even count as a general interest in environmental protection against the backdrop of the cultural and the traditional rights of Roma people. And this was a, a series of cases decided by the European Court of Human Rights concerning the rights of families of Roma descent to live in caravans on their privately owned land in the UK in accordance with their cultural traditions. But the UK uh, planning authorities, however, deemed that this was detrimental to landscape preservation and in particular to the general interest in the rural and open quality of the landscape. And this is how the court put it, the general interest in the rural and open quality of the landscape. The court here um, sided with the British authorities and left uh, the applicants no choice but to either leave their privately, they, they private property or to settle into housing by way of what can uh, be considered as a, a forced assimilation. And here again, the dynamics at stake show how um, courts can instrumentalize the concept of the general interest to uphold, in this case, aesthetic criteria to the detriment of members of the most vulnerable and marginalized community in Europe today with evident um, entrenched stereotypes and, and hostile prejudices against land deterioration by Roma occupation uh, in, in the case, which, which also shows um, how non-exclusive, semi-nomadic, and, and mobile land occupation that is characteristic of a, a Roma lifestyle can collide again with, with um, individualistic, exclusive, and sedentary ownership ingrained in a Western property paradigm. Now, uh, we can come back to this, uh, this technique and, and its use in other cases uh, that I analyze in the book, but um, the second universalization strategy that I induced from the cases concerned the recourse to expertise. And here I focused on how regional human rights courts rely on the authority of technocratic experts when balancing environmental and human rights concerns. And the case law analysis reveals a whole ecology of uh, expertise that is surrounding particular cases with scientific research centers, IOs, NGOs, special procedures like um, UN special rapporteur that really all collaborate in support of an argument against another, since experts are really invited to either substantiate or uh, to disqualify competing arguments. And to a certain extent, this case or analysis can be viewed as, as almost an early instantiation of transnational litigation uh, with, with vast uh, networks of international experts that oversee and organize, but also uh, gatekeep somehow the, the strategic legal mobilization for particular arguments against others. And these experts provide not only argumentative support that uh, reinforces the semantic authority of certain claims over others, they also provide, and I show that in the, the, the cases, a whole network of technical and material supports by financing, for example, the shooting of videos or, or, or taking certain pictures or drawing new maps or geographical boundaries, and thereby really providing concrete legal trainings uh, for the applicants, which together with, with this sort of uh, material uh, element, all serve to, to offer concrete and especially legible and registrable evidence in court. And this, of course, can have enormous benefits for the applicants as it, uh, it supports their claims, it ensures their visibility, 
it also enables to a certain extent that they vary access to courts in many ways in, in, in judicial proceedings that we know are extremely lengthy and costly. But in the book, I also uh, linger with the downsides of such strategies, especially when um, the applicants are native, indigenous, maroon, or other cultural minorities, uh, such as Roma uh, communities in Europe, as I already mentioned, who are all communities that do not necessarily share and don't necessarily inhabit the worldviews that modern human rights law enacts and often find themselves and constrained to fit their ways of thinking, of being, and of acting into pre-established normative, conceptual, and argumentative schemes of protection. And again, there are many cases where these uh, dynamics are at play and, and which I analyze in the book from the landmark um, Endorwa and Ogier cases in the African human rights uh, system to the Kalina in Lokono, Shamokashek, and Saramaka cases in the, the inter-American system, and the Inuit, the Sami, and the Roma cases, mostly in the European system. And in all these cases, I show how a recourse to expertise inevitably strengthens the, the protection of marginalized communities and frames they, they concern the rights as aligned to and hence as synergistic and in harmony with ecological considerations. But I also show how, in doing so, experts often fall back into repressive frames of essentialized authenticity of indigenous ways of living, where the very being becoming is becoming a site of uh, contestation about whether this being is still traditional or whether it has become too modern, thereby uh, excluding them from special rights schemes or special schemes of um, human rights protection. And uh, what is more, I also retrace uh, an extensive uh, practice of cross-references to precedent that are established not only within one uh, regional human rights system, which already poses important question about the politics of representation and the reproduction of essentialized understandings of particular ways of inhabiting a place when, when a claim about one indigenous community or a minority in a particular setting with a particular history is then applied to a completely different uh, community and setting. But what I observe that is even more troubling, according to me, is an increasing um, cross-referencing and reliance on argumentative strategies that take place across different regional systems. And through this, I show how contextualized, situated and embodied claims arising from localized anthropological evidence are being again mainstreamed in and across courts through Western legal schemes of uh, protection and translation. So again, I'm happy to, to, to uh, speak more about uh, the specific cases that I analyze in the book uh, during the Q&A, but in the interest of, of time, I want to conclude by drawing um, out the, the book's main contributions and try to tie them, tie them to, to contemporary issues and uh, developments in the, the field. So first, I think that uh, one of the main contributions the book offers is a broader and a contextualized understanding of the mainstreaming of a self-standing human rights to a healthy environment over the last uh, century. And uh, this right to a healthy environment, as many uh, here will know, uh, culminated, of course, in October 2021 through its recognition by the UN Human Rights Council and later in July 2022 by the UN General Assembly, with also uh, similar proposals that are currently being uh, negotiated by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which adopted a resolution in September 2021 that recommends that the Committee of Ministers draft an additional protocol to the European Convention on Human Rights on the recognition of a human right to a healthy environment. And these recent developments can be, can be conceived in many ways as only the latest iteration of the, the ever closer normative and institutional entanglement that I retrace in the book between environmental and human rights protection, where synergies are really uh, taken for granted. Second, um, the book can also serve to highlight the politics of 
um, strategic transnational environmental litigation, litigations that uh, will only increase in the phase of, of energy transition policies that, that point towards a, the need of a very distinct mode of, of, uh, of living ahead. And we already witnessed this, of course, with the rise of high profile climate cases today. But um, of course, strategic environmental litigation is, is reaching further uh, than climate harm with uh, recent uh, trends in biodiversity litigation and animal litigation too. And by shedding light on um, the different networks of expertise, the strategic argumentative schemes that are being developed and performed in court, and uh, at times reductive and, and, and sometimes violent acts of fitting ecological considerations into right frames, uh, the book also also um, highlights uh, the limitations, the risks, and, 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 and perhaps unintentional consequences that these forms of mobilization and litigation can also um, enact. And finally, the, the book also uh, problematizes particular conceptual underpinnings like subjecthood or uh, the understanding of the living and how so-called humans are expected to relate to non-humans. And here the book can be seen as denouncing somehow the reductive dynamics of representation in court for both humans and non-human entities, which uh, we see today with uh, the development of non-human rights approaches to environmental protection articulated um, under the guise of uh, rights of nature, and where this time it is human rights that are subsumed into the rights of nature rather than the, the other way around. So there would, of course, be much more to say uh, about each and, and every of these three points on a self-ending uh, right to a healthy environment, of, on, on transnational strategic litigation and rights of nature. But I hope um, we can perhaps expand on this uh, as part of the, the shared conversation and also together with uh, the audience. So with this, uh, I thank you for your attention and for your time, and um, I look forward to the, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie, uh, for uh, the very exhaustive but uh, still very uh, clear and, and, and simple presentation. I hope that our viewers uh, appreciate it and I invite them uh, from, uh, from now to really type their question in the YouTube chat. Um, but first, I maybe would like to give the floor to uh, Ricardo for uh, giving him the, the honor of, of asking the first question. Okay, Dario, perhaps you can remove the slides so we have the full screen. Yeah, fantastic. <clears throat> no, I want to I want to say very very little because uh, I'd like to see whether there are any reactions from the audience. Actually, I, I followed very very carefully uh, Marie's presentation because really uh, this is something. This is a topic and these are issues which are really interesting and um, fundamental to my. A specific research. Uh, perhaps, uh, the, 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 say, the, 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 among the many things and issues that she raised, I would like to to hear something more about uh, the her discussion about the general interest, you know, which is deeply interesting to me, how this concept uh, and notion of a general interest is used by regional human rights courts to adjudicate in these areas, these conflicts between environmental protection and human rights. Uh, um, from the examples that you make, Marie, for example, the Inuit case from the Court of Justice of the European Union or the Roma cases before the Strasbourg Court, which are pretty famous, uh, I mean, what uh, uh, <clears throat> Um, what results, uh, in my opinion, is that, of course, this concept of a general interest to environmental conservation is always invoked by the state, the defendant state, trying to, let's say, uh, say that there is a general interest in environmental protection which justifies uh, uh, restricting the rights of individuals, be it uh, the right to property or any other, uh, or the right to family life, etc., etc. Whereas on the other hand, uh, I think that there is little room for invoking the general interest by the individual applicants, at least in the, in the I mean, general interest uh, in environmental protection 
by the individual applicants, especially in the European system, which I know is more, because in that particular uh, uh, system, uh, we know that there is no uh, right to a health environment. Uh, thus, usually we know that there are uh, these cases, uh, there are several cases where the, where the Strasbourg court has always said that this particular claim cannot be adjudicated because the European Convention on Human Rights does not protect the right to a healthy environment as such. So there is no room for axio popularis or something like that, or action, the actions in, or claims brought in the general interest by individuals. So in, my, in the book that I wrote about these topics back in 2013, I criticized this particular, uh, uh, um, let's say, um, area of um, um, case law by the European Court of Human Rights, because in this, in my opinion, engenders an imbalance between individual applicants, which are never, uh, 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 which are uh, uh, really um, find it difficult to uh, invoke the general interest to environmental protection, whereas on the other hand, uh, the defendant states are always in a position to invoke this general interest. So this is why I followed very uh, carefully this uh, part of your presentation. And also, of course, this connects with what you said later on about the, uh, let's say, so far unsuccessful proposal proposals to draft an additional protocol to the European Convention on Human Rights on the right to health environment. So I'm following very carefully in these very days what's happening in that particular context because we know that there is uh, let's say that uh, there is no harmony between the parliamentary assembly and the committee of ministers which has so far rejected these uh, proposals by the parliamentary assembly i'd like to know whether maria has something to add in this respect yes can i can i uh, respond straight away yeah okay great so thank you, Ricardo, because that's a, that's a, a very uh, important and topical question that also uh, allows me to to um, to perhaps clarify a bit the scope of the the research uh, I did on the general interest in environmental um, protection. Because as you as you rightfully point out, to a certain extent, the whole uh, literature and developments we we see today in climate litigation and biodiversity litigation and animal litigation. Uh, in, in, in uh, the invocation, for example, of future generations' rights, but also rights of nature, to a certain extent, these are all strategies that try to speak in favor of an articulation of this general interest in environmental protection in a guise, in a legal discourse that can be um, that can be uh, meaningful before courts or registered before courts, legible before courts. Because as you rightly point out, at least in the European uh, system, there is no scope for actio popularis and we always need to, to, to link them back to a very specific right. And today these rights, these, these justiciable rights are being expanded to, into novel directions beyond the human subject with uh, regards to, 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 to nature as such, future generations, so beyond living subjects, et cetera, et cetera. But, and these are all uh, strategies that directly relate to the, the heart of the question of what is and what can be counted as the general interest in environmental protection. And where applicants today are trying to mobilize in order creatively in order to, to, to overcome certain barriers. But my book was trying to actually do something different because I was actually interested in how courts and how in the courtroom this general interest is discussed, but in particular cases of conflicts between environmental protection and human rights. So the applicants were applicants that were invoking their, their rights almost somehow against already the application of the general interest in environmental protection because they were really conflicts against environmental protection measures. So I think my intervention actually sheds light on something that is related, but that is different, where the applicants are not uh, are, are almost arguing against the application or misapplication of this general interest in environmental protection that states are arguing in order to justify restrictions of these rights. But I'm totally with you uh, that that uh, 
I think today and in all the, 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 the recent trends we observe in climate, biodiversity, animal litigations, and so on, this general interest is absolutely key to push against the fact that actor populares are not, uh, are not uh, admitted yet. And I think this is, we see extremely uh, successful uh, developments in this regard where, where uh, NGOs are being admitted uh, before courts, where victims, uh, the, the, the scope, nature and extent of victims of what counts as a victim is being expanded in many ways. In, in the Clima Signorina case, we see that it's in the name of the of elderly women. I mean, the group of victims is much broader. So somehow this is almost, you can say that it resembles already almost uh, actor popularities in many ways, the same with implications of future generation rights, etc. So I hope that that clarifies a bit uh, the intervention of, of, of uh, my analysis about the general interest. Yes, thank you so thank you very much, Marie. Very, very clear. Of course, it remains to be seen what the Grand Chamber of the Strasbourg Court will say about the Clima Seniorin and, and the Portuguese cases, eh? because mm -hmm. of course they are pending before the Grand Chamber. Yeah. Yeah, so I see there's no uh, question yet. So while we wait, and again, I encourage the viewers to uh, uh, to post their question, but maybe while we wait, I will just follow up with with my, one of my own. And um, maybe I was just, uh, I mean, in the context of general interest, I think, I mean, one thing that's very brief, it's that I think one, one fascinating thing that one could argue from reading some of these cases is uh, that um, in a way the interpretation of the context of general interest is also linked not just to a certain way of framing the notion of environmental protection in relation to human rights, but also to the specificities of particular legal systems, particularly when we talk about national level cases now, um, yeah. thinking of the, relating to the way in which people are allowed to use uh, private versus public uh, property and, and, and so on. And this is just a side note. I don't know if you want to, to, to say something about that. But the, the, the other thing um, that I actually wanted to ask you is, is more related to you know the the use of both general uh, general interest and the invocation of expertise as this you know what you call universalization strategies, and um, you know I just wanted to hear your thoughts on whether we can actually see um, a kind of an opposing trend sometimes. Now um, I'm not sure if we can see it yet in courts, but certainly in society and the idea that certainly. Uh, there's there's an increase and and maybe initially also in 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 policy and 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 um, and in in, in lawmaking. So the, the the increasing understanding that there are not just multiple knowledge systems, but also uh, different ways of framing this relationship. Um, so not just, for example, uh, indigenous uh, people as being kind of original and ancestral, but also being as being stewards. And so, for example, the science framing the role as stewards of 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 the environment, or for example, the emerge the the the, the growing interest towards applying also kind of a social science perspective to environmental expertise. And also there are, I think, certain trends in society where we're trying to embrace a different perspective on the use of expertise that not just the managerial technical mm -hmm. type of expertise to environmental protection. And um, and I don't know if this is something that maybe in your in your opinion will eventually kind of reach its way to, to courts or if it's something that maybe you've seen already in some cases that you've looked at, uh, but it's just a way of trying to frame you know, trying to find kind of a silver lining, uh, because certainly in society you can argue that science is is and knowledge are framed differently than they were maybe just 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good uh, observation, and I think I also uh, try to navigate this uh, in the book where I, I found myself uh, almost constrained to to divide uh, the chapter uh, on uh, expertise into uh, a European system where it focused essentially on what the role of scientific experts and of course what counts as scientific experts is is uh, very questionable but where the 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 topic of contestation where really scientific arguments scientific facts so to say that were contested by uh, experts and uh, and that courts were invited to 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 consider, and on the other hand, in the African and inter in inter American system, where the contested expertise was really one that perhaps would relate more to 
to uh, what you were saying, Darius, with uh, uh, multiple knowledge systems, where what was at stake in many cases was really a, a disregard for the, the, the worldviews and the knowledge systems of marginalized, vulnerable communities in a mainstream legal system that tend to, 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 to uh, reductively define their views as indeed cultural traditions rather than scientific understandings of a, a particular relationship to the land or to, to non-human entities. So I think, uh, and this was something that was much less observable in the cases I could retrace uh, in the European system, with the exception of these Roma cases and, of course, the Sami and the, the Inuit cases, where, again, uh, the, the tensions are very different when, when it comes to contestation of expertise with regards to scientific understandings on the one hand, and perhaps more uh, social, I mean, you know, this this, this uh, blurry of boundaries between the, the natural and the social science when it comes to understandings of, of uh, expertise. So um, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I think what we observe in these, in these cases is really a way to make sense of, uh, of these different knowledge systems and the role of experts, what counts as experts, who is recognized as an expert, and how this expertise is contested is what I think is extremely interesting in this regard to understand what are the tensions that underpin these uh, these conflicts. And just to add one one word about your the, the, the turn to managerialism, I guess my my objective was indeed to 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 perhaps unsettle a bit what can come across as really a very technocratic and managerial approach to uh, expert contestation in court by showing that actually there is much more in the surrounding the, the, the cosmos of expertise that is at stake in how these arguments are being built, what communities are being involved, how communities are being involved, what, uh, what collaborations are, are set in motion to ensure uh, these uh, these. Uh, these different schemes of protection. So, of course, there is a, there is much more than than, than the, the managerial guys uh, that that we can sense uh, throughout the cases. Thank you very much, Marie, for the for the for the uh, for the answer. I, I do wonder to what extent um, you know um, some of this reliance on a more managerial or technocratic what what you refer to as technocratic approach to sci to to using expertise or to rely on 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 expertise actually comes from um you know the the dichotomy or sense of uh, inadequacy that often courts uh have when they have to deal with scientific evidence no and the mm -hmm. fact that they might genuinely sometimes not be equipped with the type of understanding of the complexity of knowledge systems and science uh, science systems, right? And they tend to kind of fall back on what is the convenient option of the the data and the indicator, or you know, whatever. Um, I think it's it's, but it's an interesting way of kind of you know seeing it as maybe partly relates to that and partly to more kind of you know this underlying tensions that actually you impact in 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 your book. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, um, I see there are still no questions, which is unfortunate. Uh, but uh, I know also that Catherine, that Mary, Catherine needs to leave a bit earlier. So maybe I don't know if Ricardo, if you have uh, some additional point you want to make. Of course, there would be many. But uh, as as you rightly said, we 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 promise that we will uh, stop uh, after one hour. So perhaps just one point, if you if I if I'm allowed, uh, which in a way connects to what Dario just said about uh, the role or the inadequacy of human rights courts in certain in certain respects. Uh, so uh, I, I don't even if this this probably was not one of your main research objectives, Marie. Uh, I wonder what is uh, your overall, uh, um, let's say, overall uh, uh, opinion about the performance of human rights courts in this area. So this is an institutional issue, uh, which is, of course, very uh, this is a trite question, which is always repeated in legal circles. Uh, uh, are human rights courts uh, indeed the 
appropriate bodies to solve environmental issues? Uh, should we need uh, um, uh, something new from the institutional side in international law? Um, isn't the involvement of human rights courts something of a replacement uh, for the inadequacies of uh, dispute settlement uh, in environmental law? So I, I'd like to know whether you see a future in the role of human rights courts in this area, or whether you see a, a, a role which will be, let's say, downplayed or uh, in a way uh, they, will, they will diminish in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's undeniable to say that there is a, a fundamental role for human rights institutions in this regard today. We see it with, again, I think the the... the the, the, the blossoming of, of creative climate litigation is really a case in point where, where, uh, where the success is undeniable again and is absolutely promising in this regard. But I do think that this is absolutely not the merit of the courts. It's the merit in many ways of the, the massive social mobilization, the, the activists that are behind bringing these cases in the courts and trying to really reframe the discourse, break away from the boundaries, the limitations, the obstacles that come with, inevitably, with the human rights approach that necessarily falls back into a liberal individualized victim, a state with territorial boundaries and very specific harms that have to be linked causally to both the victim and the state. And this is something where there is an, a, an undeniable limitation and obstacle in terms of human rights or today also non-human rights based approaches to environmental protection, where there is a necessarily subjective territorial procedural cut that, uh, that just fits uncomfortably with ecological issues that are by nature moving, dynamic, um, exceeding these, uh, these, uh, these uh, narrow cat juridical categories that we are obliged to deal with. But again, if we look uh, whether it's uh, the, the, the recent cases in the UN, uh, the, the, the UN uh, Human Rights Committee or the, the, the UN Committee on, on the Rights of the Child, the arguments that are being put forward to break away from these narrow categories are remarkable. And there is definitely a, a, a momentum, let's say, to, to, push, uh, to push against these limitations. So there's definitely hope, but I think the hope uh, comes from, 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 from the activists that are really trying to, to refuse to, dissettle, to, to dismantle these, these categories and, and rework them differently. Very well, thank you. Dario. Yes, I would uh, then uh, try to uh, uh, send uh, Marie to uh, her uh, other uh, workshop since uh, we are approaching the cutoff time for uh, for today's webinar. But I would really like to thank you for uh, agreeing to participate today. We hope it was an interesting opportunity to discuss some of the themes of um, of your book. It was an interesting opportunity, I'm sure, also for the audience, even though they seem to be a bit shy today. But in any case, the video will be there for um, uh, it will be there on YouTube and uh, it will be available for uh, for all the interested viewers. So uh, again, I thank you on, on my side. We will uh, give uh, further notice to uh, our viewers about future uh, webinars and activities of the module. And uh, maybe Ricardo wants to say one last word before we close and yourself also, Marie, maybe. Well, I'd just like to uh, um, also say thank you to Marie for being with us today. I'm pretty sure that this webinar will be viewed by many in the in the future, in the in the coming weeks and months, because as Dario said, it will be permanently available in our uh, YouTube channel. So thank you so much for being with us, Maria. We hope that there will be uh, many other occasions uh, for collaboration and I do invite all the audience uh, to read carefully your book because I think this is really uh, something interesting you know? and it's not uh, very frequent to find interesting books so <laughs> it's uh, uh, this is really an encouragement to the audience to read your book. Well thank you that's uh, that's very uh, nice I wish I could have the, the same problem I tend to find every book uh, 
too many books, too interesting to read. So I, I'm, I'm always going down the rabbit hole in that regard. But thank you so much, Dario and, and Ricardo for, for the kind invitation, for this opportunity to engage again with, uh, with the, the, the community in Siena. And, uh, I look forward to, uh, to future collaborations as well. Thank you so much for your time and, and interest. Thank you again, Marie, and have a nice rest of the day. Thank and you. And the same to our viewers. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. everyone.